is that we have those components to us as human beings. Come over to Hebrews chapter 4. Come over to Hebrews chapter 4 and look with me at verse 12. Now in the past, I've done long studies and so forth and listened to a lot of preaching where people have tried to explain the difference, okay? And I'm not, I'm not demeaning that. I'm not belittling that. It's important to try to understand those things, okay? But as I was, I was sharing with Brother Will when he was done, for me, a lot of that ends up trying to definitively explain the difference between my soul and my spirit is difficult for me. And I think the reason it is is because of this verse right here. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing of sunder of soul, and what? Look, if you're going to divide asunder between two things, that means there's two things that need to be what? Divided between, right? So you have a spirit, you have a soul, okay? Who is capable of distinguishing the difference between the two of them? Not Brian Ross, okay? Not some other preacher. It's the Word of God. Look what it says. Piercing even the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Word of God, the Scripture, God's Word is the thing that is able to delineate and distinguish between your soul and your spirit, okay? It's able to distinguish and discern the thoughts and the intents of your heart. So instead of spending a lot of time this morning explaining the differences between the soul and the spirit, I want to use a very sort of basic division, and that's the difference between your inner man and your outward man, okay? In the culture, a lot of people that you will run into are materialists, okay? They believe that the only thing that exists is what? Matter, right? This pulpits matter, my hands matter, my hairs matter. It's, it's matter in different permutations or different forms, but it's all what? It's all matter, right? So they say, materialists will say that the only thing that exists is matter, and they'll do that because it can be proven, right? It can be proven through, you know, empirical science and study and so on and so forth, and they deny that you have an immaterial part, okay? Now the Scriptures teach the opposite. The Scriptures teach that you have an inward man, you have a part to you as a human being that is immaterial, okay? And you also have an outward what? Man, you have a body, right? You have a spirit, you have a soul, you have a what? Body. Well, your body, that's your outward man, right? It's the thing that you see and breathe. And, and when we see each other coming into the church, we identify each other by our outward form and the outward appearance of our outer man, right? But we can't see the immaterial part. But you need to realize something. Hold your hand there and come quick to Genesis 2. Hold your hand there and come quick to Genesis 2. You are not fundamentally your body. Okay? Your body does not make you who you are. What makes you who you are is your soul. All right? Look at this verse. Ephesians, or, Ephesians sorry. Genesis chapter 2, look at verse 7. Okay? The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. What was that? What did God form out of the dust of the ground? He formed his what? His body. Right? His, 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 out, his body, his flesh, his outward man, right? Now watch what it says. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of what? So God breathes his spirit. He, he, he forms Adam out of the dust of the ground. Then he breathes his spirit into Adam. Okay? And what's the result of that? The result of Adam having a body and God breathing his spirit into him is that man became a living what? Soul. You are fundamentally your soul, right? Okay? Your soul is who you are. It's, a fun, it's the foundation of who you are. You are a soul inhabiting a what? A body. Paul talks in his epistles about if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, right? Talking about our what? Our body. We have a house not made with hands, eternal where? In the heavens. Paul talks about those issues, right? So as we think about this, come to, come to Ephesians 3. You need to see that you have an inner man. Ephesians chapter 3, look at verse 16. Ephesians chapter 3, look at verse 16. Notice what it says, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit, where? In the inner man. The inner man is your soul and spirit. The inner man is the immaterial part of who you are as a human being, right? That's what the Scripture identifies as your 
inner man. Come to 2 Corinthians 4. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul calls it your inward man. The part of you that is inward. The part of you that is immaterial. The part of you that you can't see. But just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not what? There doesn't mean it's not real. And the Word of God in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it's what's able to distinguish and divide asunder between your soul and your what? And your spirit, okay? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. It says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man what? Perish. What's your outward man? That's his body, right? But though your outward man perish, yet the inward man is what? Renewed day by day. So right there in that verse, God's distinguishing between your outward man, that's your body, and your inward man, which would be your soul and your spirit. Okay, The one is renewed day by day. The inner man, the outward man, is perishing. We know that, right? If you live long enough, despite all the advances in medical science and so forth, the death rate is still what? One apiece. That's what the death rate is. It's still one apiece, right? It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the what? The judgment, right? So our outward man is, is dying, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. So we have an outward, our, the outward form, the outward tabernacle, the outward tent that we dwell in of our body, but the essence of who we really are is our inward man, our soul, and our what? Spirit. Your body's going to die one day. Your, your physical body's going to die, but your soul and spirit will go somewhere based upon what you believe, right? If you believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried, rose again, and you trust that and that alone for your salvation, you'll go where? You'll go to heaven, right? You'll go to be with the Lord, right? If you don't trust that, you'll go to eternal punishment, sorry to say. But that's the reality according to the Scripture, Okay. In your inner man, you have a function in your inner man called your heart. Okay? Now, obviously, you also have a physical organ in your chest called your heart that pumps blood and so forth, keeps you alive and all that sort of thing, right? But you also have, an, as an immaterial part of your inner man, something that the Scripture calls the heart. Come with me to Philipp Ephesians 2. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. He says here, Paul says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in what? Trespasses and sins, right? So a, a human being that is born into this world in their natural state, okay, is born into this world because of the inherited sin of Adam, they are born into this world dead in what? trespasses and sins, right? So Paul says there in that verse, and you hath he quickened who were what? So the Ephesians are saved. The Ephesians are believers here, and they've been quickened, they've been made alive, but that's not who they used to be, right? They used to be dead in what? Trespasses and sins. Verse 2, where and in time past you walked according to the course of this world. So before they were saved, did the Ephesians walk according to the course of this world? Yes. Do they walk according to the prince, the power of the air? Yes. Do they walk according to the spirit that thou worketh in the children of what? Disobedience. Yes, yes, and what? Yes. Verse 3, among whom, we also, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of what? Wrath, even as others. Okay. What that means is all of us, when we came into the world, did we have, because of who our, because we were kin to Adam, did we have the wrath of God abiding upon us? Were we dead in trespasses and sins? Were we following the course of the world? Okay? All that is all true until we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, right? When we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, what used to be dead in trespasses and sins, where there was death and condemnation and wrath, had the life of God infused to it, had, had spiritual life imparted to it, had just received justification and forgiveness of sins and life in Jesus Christ. You guys with all that? Okay? Now, humans are by nature the children of wrath, and as such they are born into this life with the wrath of God abiding upon us. Okay? 
That means that man in his natural state, man in his state as he is born into the world, has an issue. Come to, now come with me to Jeremiah 17.9. Jer, come over to Jeremiah 17.9. Now while you're turning there, I want to ask you a few questions, okay? When you were in that condition, were you a singular person? When you were dead in trespasses and sins, did you have a spirit? Did you have a soul? Did you have a body? Were you a singular entity? Were you a person? Okay? The problem is that your spirit was dead to the life of God. Right? Your spirit was dead to the life of God, and because your spirit was dead to the life of God, did you have God's wrath abiding upon you? Now, when you got saved, when you trusted the finished work of Christ, and He quickened your inner man, and he put his, He's put His Spirit in your spirit, did He bring the life of God into your body? Okay? Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can want? Know it. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Okay, The problem that you and I had when we were born into this world is we had a heart defect. Didn't we? The problem is that we were born with a, with a heart that the Scripture says is deceitfully wicked, is desperately wicked, who can want? It's deceitful above all things, verse 9, and desperately wicked, who can know it? Okay, now, let me say, that verse is talking about a lost man's what? Heart, okay? That's man's, that's man's spiritual condition by virtue of being born of Adam. That's what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 2, when he talks about how they were following the course of the world, following the prince of power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, and were by nature the children of wrath. If God were to judge you on the basis of that heart condition there, it would not be good. Okay? Come over to Genesis 6. Come over to Genesis 6. Now, I understand... Like I said, even just this week, I heard that verse mentioned and applied to believers. Jeremiah 17, 9. Genesis chapter 6, look at verse 5. So the context here is, is God, is, He sees the condition of man in the earth before the flood. And notice what, he, what, notice what He observes about man. Verse 5, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination, notice, of the thoughts of his heart was only evil how often? So man in his, man in his lost state, go read Romans chapter 1. Man in his lost state, left, left in that situation, his deceitful and desperately wicked heart, Romans chapter 1 says that man becomes an inventor of evil things. Okay, And God looks at the situation and he, he sees... Man, he sees the hearts of men and he says that the thoughts and the intents, the imaginations and the thoughts of his heart was only evil. How often? Continually. Now, I mentioned Romans 1. Go get Romans chapter 1. Go get Romans chapter 1. And look with me at verse 21. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Notice what happened. It says, because that when they knew God. So, folks, was back up. But go, go to verse uh, 19. Watch. Because that when they knew God, because that which might be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath what? If you go all the way back to the beginning of time, did man have a God awareness? Did, God, did man know who God was? Had God expressed Himself in the creation? Had, did God talk to Adam and Eve and so forth? Did they know who God was? Verse 20, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, <clears throat> even as eternal power and God has, so that they were without excuse. Now look at verse 21. Because that when they knew God, so did they know who God was? Yes, they knew who God was. They glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was what? The lights went out in their heart. They knew who God was, 
and they chose other things above God to replace God. If you read on, it says that they, that they chose and they, they worshiped the creature instead of the what? Creator, okay? And they took the truth of God and the knowledge of God that they had, and they swapped it out in favor of their own wisdom, their own understanding, and their own religion, and their own performance, and so forth, and they, worship the, they end up worshiping the creature instead of the Creator, right? But notice the problem there is that they have a foolish and darkened what? Heart. Look at verse 24. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. God gives man over to the lusts of his own what? Heart. Okay? God says, you don't want to retain me and my you want to retain me and your knowledge and so forth, and you want other things instead. He says, here, what? Have at it. Does the lost man have a heart problem? Yeah. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But af, Notice what it says. But after thy hardness and impenitent, what? Heart. You understand that that lost heart doesn't like somebody coming along with the gospel and saying that it's dead. That it has no life. That it's incapable of producing anything that God will what? Accept. You're, the lost man's heart doesn't like hearing that because his, in his dead, corrupt heart, does he think he's good? Does he think he can make God happy with him, make himself God happy with him and so forth, and earn his own salvation and, and so on and so forth, right? But then the truth of the gospel comes along and it says, wait a minute, there's a problem here, you're a sinner. Right? And as a sinner, you can't bring forth anything that God will accept. You need to trust and rely exclusively on the Lord Jesus Christ. And his heart's like, whoa, time out. There's nothing wrong here. He says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the righteous judgment of God. Come over to Ephesians 4. Come over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18. <coughs> Paul's talking about the Gentiles. Verse 17, This I say therefore in testifying the Lord, that ye, that's the Ephesians. Okay, now remember, in chapter 2, who had been quickened and made alive? The Ephesians, who used to be dead in trespasses and sins. The Ephesians, right? Who used to be following the course of the world. Used to be following the prince of the power of the air. Used to be following the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Used to have the wrath of God abiding upon them. It was who? The Ephesians, right? Notice verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye, you Ephesians, you guys that are quickened and made alive, who aren't in that condition anymore, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their what? Mind having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their what? That's who, the, that's who and what and where the Gentiles are. So, a lost man's heart, today, if we look at the verses that we just looked at, number one, it's described as deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Number two, it's described as only evil continually in terms of its imaginations and thoughts. Number three, it's at enmity with God. Number four, it's hard and impenitent. And number five, it's blind and not able to understand and process spiritual truth. So I'll say that again. Some of you are writing and I'm going too fast. Number one, it's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Number two, it's only evil continually in terms of its imaginations and thoughts. Number three, it's at enmity with God. Okay? Number four, it's hard and impenitent. And number five, it is blind and not able to understand or process spiritual truth. That is the condition of the lost man's what? Heart. Come over to Colossians chapter 2. Now, think about the lost man now for a minute. If his heart is all of those things, 
The only thing that he knows how to do is function out of that what? That heart. Okay? That's the only thing he has a power, knowledge, and ability to do. That's why Paul said in Ephesians 4, where we just looked at, he says that you walk not as the Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, okay? And the reason they're walking that way is because in verse 18, their foolish heart was what? Darkened. Okay? When you get saved, when you trust Christ, the gospel, the gospel, the grace of God, shines the light of truth into the darkness of that lost man's heart. Okay? And that lost man, with the lights now turned on, does he have the ability to decide, to choose, if he is going to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as the only payment for his sin, or if he's going to continue to meander around in the darkness of his own what? Heart. Is everybody with me? You guys are quiet, so I don't know if it's because you're too hot or what. I guarantee you, you're not as hot as I am. Colossians chapter 2. Is that where I told you to go? So out of that situation, out of the situation that I just described, he has an old man. He has, an old, he has a reality. He has a distinction. He has a manner of life. He has an identity in Adam, in his sin, in that situation, right? Can he save himself? No. That's why, hear me folks, that's why it is a waste of time to tell a dead, lost person that the way they get saved is to turn from their sin. If I'm dead in trespasses and sins, and I turn from my sin, I'm still what? I'm still dead in trespasses and sins, right? What I need is a redeemer. What I need is a deliverer. What I need is for somebody to reach into my predicament and, and carry me out of it and to do for me what I could not do for myself, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Colossians chapter 2, something happened to you when you trusted Christ. You didn't feel it, okay? You couldn't like feel this happening, but it happened to you, and the way you know it happened to you is you believe in, you read the Word and you believe what it says, right? Colossians chapter 2, <coughs> verse 11. Well, verse 10, you got to get verse 10, and ye are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality and power. Understand, you went from being the enemy of God, with the wrath of God abiding upon you, to being complete in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, well, how'd that happen? Verse 11. In whom also, that's in Christ, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without what? Hands. Now, you all, I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining physical circumcision. You can go back and read about that in the Old Testament, right? It's an unpleasant conversation to talk about in church anyway, right? But that verse says that you have it, you were made, that you were circumcised with a circumcision made without what? So that means that's a spiritual operation. The verse is going to actually call it that in a minute, right? Now watch what happened. In the circumcision made without hands, in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision that which is of who? Okay? Now, how many parts to you as a person do you have? You have a spirit, soul, and what? So when you trusted Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit performed a spiritual operation on you whereby your soul and your spirit were cut away from the body of sins of what? The flesh, right? Before you were saved, the only thing you knew how to do was what? Sin. Okay, that's it. Because your, the, the core of who you were, your inner man, your soul and spirit, were joined hard to a body of sin. You with me? Okay? Uh, the fan just messed me up here. Hang on a minute. Verse eleven, in whom verse eleven, in whom ye were circumcised, ye in whom ye are. Notice the notice the tense on that. This is a done deal, folks. Okay, in whom ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of who, Christ. Okay, how buried with him by baptism, wherein ye are what. Risen with him, watch through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from what? You understand, you went through a spiritual operation. You went through a spiritual circumcision that was performed on you when you trusted Christ as you were identified with him in his death, 
His burial and His resurrection, He cut your soul and spirit. He cut your inner man away from the body of sins of what? The flesh. Okay? Now, so where before there was death and sin and corruption, now there's forgiveness of sins. Look at verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, watch, hath he quickened together with who? I mean, Colossians 2, verse 13, you got to see this. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you how many trespasses? All. All. You understand that the Lord Jesus Christ took care of every single thing that was wrong with you and I. Amen. Okay? And when we got identified with Him and we went through His death and through His burial and through His resurrection spiritually, we came out the other side as a holy new creature. You weren't just, I've said it this way before and it was wrong, you weren't just renovated, you weren't just fixed up a little bit, Okay? No. You go through that process and you come out the other side a new what? A new creature. Okay? With a soul and a, with a spirit that is now alive to the life of God and, and forgiveness of sins. Now this operation was performed according to verse 12 through our baptism and identification with Christ in His death his burial, and resurrection. And the result of that is the formation of a new creature. Come to Rome, come over to Romans 6. <clears throat> come over to Romans 6. <coughs> I know I've taught this before, but I don't get tired of teaching this. And you should never get tired of hearing this. Okay? Because... You, there's that verse over there in the, in, the, in the pastoral epistles. I'm drawing a blank as to where it is. But Paul tells Timothy, he says, these things affirm constantly. Why does he tell him that? Because your, tenden your tendency is to let your mind what? Go towards. Go towards other stuff and to drift off into other things, right? And to not keep your focus squarely on who God says you are in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Look at, look at um, Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His what? Folks, that's not talking about water. That's talking about spiritual identification. Okay. Therefore, therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall also be in the likeness of His what? Resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is what? See, that old person that you were, when you were that person and you had a body and a soul and a spirit, right? And you were dead in trespasses and sins. That guy, that girl, that woman, that man was hung there on the cross positionally in the Lord Jesus Christ and died with Christ. Amen. That's what he's saying. It died with Christ. So when you are raised then to walk in newness of life, you are raised not as that person who is dead in trespasses and sins. You're raised as a new creature in who? In Christ. Okay, verse, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not what? See, before you had this operation performed on you, you had no choice. You had no capacity. You had no power to do anything other than what? Sin. But that's not who you are anymore. Okay? Verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from what? Sin. That's what Paul's talking about in Colossians 2.11, where he's talking about the body of the sins of what? The flesh. You've been delivered from that thing. You've been cut away. Now, here's the reality practically though, right? Is my soul and spirit good with, is God good with my soul and spirit? But until the day of redemption, okay, until the catching away of the church, the body of Christ, where I will receive a body fashioned like after the glorious body of the Lord Jesus Christ, do I still reside in this 
body of sin. Okay? Is that a fact? Yes. But this body of sin doesn't have dominion over me anymore. That's the point. Where when I was lost and dead in sin, it had dominion over me. I had no other ability but to sin. Romans 6, look at verse 8. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also what? Live with Him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more what? Dominion over Him. For in that He died, He died unto sin once. But then that He liveth, He liveth unto who? God. Verse 11. Likewise. What's the next word? Reckon. That's an accounting term, folks. You and I have to reckon that what God just told us in verses 1 through 10 is true. Okay? We have to reckon it. We have to account it to be true. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Okay? Drop down for the sake of time. Man, there's just so much good stuff in here. Verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are under the law, but under grace? What's the answer? God forbid. There's all this messed up theology out there where people will say, well, if you tell somebody they're under the law, that, that they're not under the law, but that they're under grace, what you're going to do is you're just going to give them license to sin. Really? Didn't your flesh just know how to do that, whether you knew anything about grace at all? Because that's what it did. To have victory over sin, you understand who you are, you reckon it to be so, and say, that doesn't have to have what? Dominion over me anymore. Go to verse 20. Romans 6, 20. For when we were the servants of sin... For, for when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from what? Righteousness. Now, verse 22. But now, there's a change that's happened. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting what? Come with me to 2 Corinthians 5, and then I'm move on to my last point. What you need to understand, what I need to understand, is that we are not schizophrenic saints. Okay? We are not saints that are walking around with two natures. An old nature and a new nature. Because our old man is what? It's dead. It's crucified. It's put off. It's circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Okay? It has no more power. It has no more dominion over you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? New creature. A new creature. Old things are what? Passed away. Behold, all things are become what? New. As a believer, do I still have a body? Do I still have a soul? Do I still have a spirit? What's the difference? The difference is that I now have the life of God in my spirit. God the Holy Spirit came in and, and, and dwells and inhabits my spirit. And the other thing is, this has an impact on our heart, on the very core of who we are. Go to Romans 5. When it says, behold, old things are passed, what? Away. So when you were identified with Christ in His death, in His burial, and His resurrection, did you come up 
from that resurrection with Christ to walk in newness of life with the same heart you had before you were saved? No. Okay? Behold, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become what? New. That would include your what? So what used to be, let's review, what used to be deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, what used to be only evil continually, what used to be at enmity with God, understand, reconciliate, you were reconciled to God, right? If you were reconciled to God, did God put away the enmity? Okay? What used to be hard and impenitent, and what used to be blind and not able to understand spiritual truth, now has this, Romans 5.5. 5. And hope make it not ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad. Where? In our hearts. By who? The Holy Ghost, which is what? you got to understand, folks, you are a new creature. You weren't just like, you know, they didn't just wash the dirt out from behind your ears and under your toenails when you got saved. No, you were identified with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. You came up on the other side a holy new creature. Okay? With the ability to please God. With the ability to, to, to do the will of God from your what? From your heart. We'll see that in a minute, okay? But the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. The, by who? The Holy Ghost, which is what? The Holy Ghost is given to you. Right? The Holy Ghost is your seal unto the day of redemption. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Your inner man, God is, God is totally good. Understand. Is God well pleased with His Son? So if I'm in His Son as a believer, and His Son is in me, and He circumcised me with a circumcision made without hands, and I was identified in His death, burial, and resurrection, is God good with me? Yes. The problem is, is that you, the problem is your flesh. Your flesh is the residual brain wiring of your old man. Is your old man dead? Yes, but did that old man teach you to think and process and, and, and go through information in your life in a certain way, right? Yes. So what, what is it that needs to be renewed? By the renewing of your mind, right? We renew our mind to get rid of that old thinking. But that old man doesn't have power over me anymore because it's what? It's dead. And instead of it, I, instead of that, I have a new heart, that was given to me in Christ, in which God the Holy Spirit resides. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. He says, Who hath also sealed us. We should probably read verse 21 first. Now, which he, now he which establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us in God, who hath also sealed us, and given us the earnest of the Spirit, where? Our hearts. Hold your hand there and go over to Ephesians chapter 1. Where did God put His Spirit? He put His Spirit in your what? In your heart. The love of God, Romans 5, is shed abroad in our what? Hearts by the Holy Ghost that is what? Given to us. We just read this verse here in, in 2 Corinthians. It says, who has sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit into our what? When it's talking about the earnest of the Spirit, you need to think Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Okay? Verse 12, to whom, or excuse me, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. Ye trusted in who? Christ, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with who? The Holy Spirit of what? Promise, verse 14, which is the earnest 
of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His what? Who is the earnest of your inheritance, folks? The Holy Spirit. And when God gave you the Holy Spirit as the earnest of your inheritance unto the day of redemption, He put His Spirit as the earnest into your what? Heart. 2 Corinthians, go back to 2 Corinthians, get chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. I was talking about this a minute ago. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? Lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So that's what I was talking about, right? Does that dead, lost man in Adam, does he have a darkened heart? Yes. And when the God, when he hears the gospel, the truth of his salvation, when he hears that message preached, does it shine the light of understanding into the darkness of his heart? Right? And that's what Satan doesn't want. It, look what this verse says. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light. What does Satan not want? He does not want the light of the gospel to reach the darkness of that lost man's what? heart because he knows that if it does does the gospel have the ability to turn the lights of his understanding on Amen. verse 5 for we preach not ourselves but the Lord Jesus and ourselves your servants for Jesus sake for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our where hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of who? Jesus Christ. Is there anything wrong with you anymore? You say, oh, but pastor, you don't know what I did last night. You're right, I don't want to know. Okay? But you know what? God knew you were going to do that before He sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for you. Okay? And when, when you trusted Christ, He didn't give you sort of like a provisional, you know, get out of jail free card until you screw up again. That's not what He did. He made you a new creature in who? In Christ. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. In verse 5, he talks about to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. That's a whole other topic. Not, not, only, not only did he give you a heart, but he gave you a, he gave you a, he gave you a seat at the table as a full adult son of, of God. Verse 6, And because ye are sons. Notice the logical progression here. And because ye are sons. God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your what? Hearts crying what? Do you understand that if you are a believer, is God the Holy Spirit in your heart right now crying, Abba, Father? The Spirit of God resides within your heart, and He's crying, Abba, Father, right now as you listen to this message. Now you don't know that. Because that's a function of your inner man. That's going on in you spiritually, right? You can't feel that the way you can feel if you hit your finger with a hammer. Okay? But is it real? The way you know about it is to when you read the what? The Word of God and let the Scripture teach you about it. Go to Ephesians 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. I'm just going to read some verses now for the sake of time. Verse 16, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit. Where? Where? 
in the inner man. You're going to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, right? That Christ may dwell in our hearts by what? Faith. He's going to dwell where? In our hearts. Go to Ephesians 5, look at verse 19. Ephesians 5, verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody where? In your heart to the Lord. You know, God doesn't care what your voice sounds like. Thank God for that. Okay? Because what's really going on when you worship God is something going on where? In your heart, in your inner man. Ephesians 6, verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in singleness of your what? Heart, as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from where? Do you understand that if your heart was not new, you would have no ability to do the will of God. Because you would still be who you were in Adam, dead in trespasses and what? Sins. Go to Colossians 3. I know it's hot in here, okay? But I'm, I'm going to finish. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule where in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful let the word of christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your what hearts to who the lord for first timothy chapter 1 First Timothy chapter 1. Verse 4. Well, verse 3, he says, And I besought thee to abide still in Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some, that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity... Out of a what? Pure heart. And out of a good conscience and a faith of fame. Is there anything wrong with your heart anymore? Last one, 2 Timothy 2. Verse 22. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, Faith, charity, peace. Now watch. With all them that call on the Lord out of what? A pure heart. On the basis of the blood of Christ, God Almighty has performed open heart surgery on us, if you will. Okay? He didn't just clean us up. He didn't just fix us up. He didn't just renovate us. Old things are, we're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become what? New. And you know what that means? Okay, here's what that means at the end of the day. That means that God Almighty is okay and good with Brian Ross. To the very heart and core of who I am as a person. I'm not a schizophrenic saint. I'm not running around with two natures, woohoo, trying to figure out which. No. I'm a new creature in who? Christ with a, the possessor of a new heart in which God the Holy Spirit resides. Okay? So instead of going around and, 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 and oh, Jer I'm just a Jer so Jeremiah 17, 9 heart, brother. That means God Almighty is in your heart. That means His truth is in your heart. That means His word is in your heart. So what, what's going on right now as I'm preaching to you? I'm preaching at your what? This. So that you can get this in line with what's already true where? Here. 
I was talking with some folks the other day, or just yesterday, and we used to think that you, 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 that you get it here so that you can get this right. This is already right. This is what's in process. So when I'm preaching to you and I'm trying to explain these things from, from the Scripture, I'm, I'm, I'm appealing to your intellectual ability to what? Understand, right? Now that I've taught it to you, what do you need to do? You need to reckon it to be what? So, you need to agree with God about what God says about who you are. And the truth of who we are runs ahead of our emotions. Runs ahead of our circumstance. And we get wallowing in the emotion of the circumstance, and we go, oh, that can't possibly true, be true of me. And the whole time God's saying it's true, you need to renew that mind of yours and get it in line with what I've already said. Does that make sense? Okay. So what is left to be transformed? Romans 12, 1 and 2. What's left to be transformed? By the, or for a metamorphosis? It's not your heart. It's not your inner man. It's this. It's your brain. That's what the conference is about. So if you don't want to come now, I don't know what else I could do to try to persuade you to want to. Okay? But folks, let me just leave you with this. If I can get this thing to work. I'm all sticky now from being sweaty, and it won't work. We need to reckon. We need to... Number one, know Romans 6. We need to know what the Scripture says. I just spent an hour telling you what it says. We need to reckon it second to be so and agree with what God says. We need to account and reckon that what God says about us is true is in fact what? True. And number three, we then need to obey from the what? The heart. That what is true is in fact what? True. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. We're grateful for the saints that are here to hear your word preached. That are willing to endure no air conditioning. And great infirmity of the flesh. Just kidding. We're glad that we could be here and spend time in your word. We pray that what we've discussed will be edifying. And we just pray that we can get it in our mind. And once we get it into our mind, that we'll start talking and functioning like who we are, not like who we used to be. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.